it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I haven't been to Brisbane for 11 years, so it's always a good excuse to come back. Thank you. If you may be wondering why my accent, which is not entirely a Kiwi accent, is, uh, blame my husband for that, is um, I'm from Brazil originally, so I've been in New Zealand for 11 years. And, um, yeah, it's been a, a massive journey from on my big farm in Brazil to become a mobster wife and uh, there uh, a sales uh, manager for Gladfield, so it's um, been wonderful. So before I kick start my speech about the good and the bad of the, the mobs and about a bit about Gladfield, I'd like to thank David from the first choice for the chance of being here. It's, uh, as I said, it's a real pleasure. I was going to touch up a little bit of Gladfield, you know, who we are. Uh, a little bit about uh, how good barley makes good beer and uh, how to recognise a good malt. And also how you can make the most of the good malt in your, in your pilot brewery or, you know, in your home brewing system. Or in your professional brewing as well. So, you can see a part of us um, that's Doug there and me. We, um, been doing lead fuel for 11 years, as I said. Started off as a passion for growing barley, malting barley. We Doug's been a malting barley grower for five generations. And we got kind of a sick of uh, selling our very, very nice growing barley to the multinational body company, thrown into a massive silo, and you don't get any remuneration for growing good quality. It's all about quality. And, um, and we're getting pretty much the same price as his father was getting when he was farming. So, as you can imagine, the price has always gone up, but, um, you know, for growing the barley, but not um, actually selling it. We are a great bunch of people. <laughs> we got five full timers, and to be honest, they, that's what makes Glad feel. They're a great team. Um, We've got uh, Crystal on the, on the uh, red shirt, she's my admin lady and I tell you what, she's phenomenal, she organised all my orders, uh, she's, you know, make sure everything runs smooth, she's a huge part of the great service for Gladfield. As a husband and wife, she, her husband there in the back of the Benny, so we're pretty proud to be a full income for one family, which it makes me get out of the bed, you know, and uh, work hard to carry on Gladfield. Uh, on this day here in particular, we, we're very proud of this photo. We managed to bag up 13 tonne of malt in one and a half hours. Um, it's not amazing when uh, I'll pass it on to the team. Um, it was, yeah, it's amazing when you start exporting and the pressure of water's coming. That's what you need to do. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a great team. And if, um, if it, you know, we, um, we're doing a good job, we've got one in three chances to carry on playing field, so. <laughs> <laughs> so these are our kids, uh, they're, they're hard shots, I tell you. <laughs> so let's go and talk about, you know, what makes Gladfield unique and probably what, uh, what we have to offer for you on a craft beer scene. Um, we believe strong belief that a good barley makes good malt. How I prove this is that you have to grow malt, malt, uh, malting barley into a perfect environment. And unfortunately, continental countries cannot do that, uh, especially for weather, like uh, Australia do struggle to grow good quality uh, malting barley. Do grow perfect wheat, I must admit, it's uh, more plus. But the barley uh, struggles with the heat of, of you guys got the lack of irrigation. Gladfield situated in the Canterbury Plains uh, is uh, um, 40 minutes south of Christchurch. If you, someone has been there, and if you haven't, uh, our doors is always open for you guys to visit us. Come and you know do a, a bit of a, a tour. Uh, we're happy to show you where the malts are made. Going back to the, to the weather, so it's a maritime climate. New Zealand is a very small country, um, compared especially to Brazil and Australia. 
is um, so we got the fine winds from um, you know from the from the sea that uh, keep the temperature cool uh, during the night and uh, is actually reasonably warm during the day. Warm for New Zealand standards, not for Australian standards, I must say. <laughs> and um, it helps with the barley likes a cool climate. Growing slowly, we grow half of our farm uh, in uh, spring, uh, in autumn, uh, last week of autumn, and then we are uh, sowing the spring one now, which is last week, week of winter, to be our spring barley. So it's about a valid point. I'm sorry, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself here about us that we grow half of the barley as probably um, noticed that we are the growers, but we're glad to evolve to to uh, phenomenal growth as. You know, it's, you can tell by you know, the growth of stone and wood and, and some of the awesome guys that were here before me. And we are piggyback on their growth. So 50% uh, comes from our farm. The rest 50% comes from our real loyal uh, growers that we have around us. And they were unsatisfied by growing to multinationals as we were. And uh, we, we look after them remuneration wise. So we pay a lot of money for, for the barley because we know that it makes uh, good malt. And also we have loyalty schemes, you know, you grow for more than two, three years in a row, uh, you get a bonus. And also if you grow to the specs that we want and top that up with, uh, you know, good, uh, even greater barley, we will pay you a bonus as well. Uh, so it's all these little things that we do to look after the source of the malt. It's really important for us. So only good, uh, good barley gets into the germination box of Gladfield. I took this photo. Uh, uh, the grain on your on your right is um, is uh, a grain that's graded. The grain on your left is a skinny grain that's not going to do much for me on the germination boxes uh, for malting. So it's actually to the neck and I, I was really impressed myself to see the difference on it. It's from the same line, it's just come from the seed cleaner that I went in there and collect the malt, uh, the barley that was going to the steeps. And then I went to the screening so, uh, side and then grabbed the skinny and had a wee comparison. And yeah, I was, I was pretty, pretty happy to see that the, the seed cleaner is doing its, uh, its job. That malt on the left, that barley on the left is going to, you know, it's too much hard <coughs> for a ratio of grain, which is giving you a lot of uh, no stringency when you, for example, if I'm doing a roasted malt. Just getting ahead of myself here, I'm going to get to that. So, uh, so you can notice this grain is a clean looking grain, uh, no fungal growth in here because our climate is, is perfect for, you know, we don't have a lot of overcast days when we are wanting to harvest. And we have the Norwesters uh, coming through, which is a nice cool, uh, hot wind that comes from the mount, from the Alps, uh, which um, dry the barley for us on the plant. So we do it through a minimum drying uh, of the barley as we can. Uh, we need to get that barley at 40% uh, moisture so we can store it in the silos for a year. If you get it uh, above 40%, you're going to have uh, some bugs growing into that silo. So the, the lower the moisture, the, the better on the harvesting time. Uh, we need uh, great levels of nitrogen. It's, um, it's something that uh, is really deep talk on the malting industry, uh, the, the nitrogen levels of, of the malt and the nitrogen level of the barley. I must admit, I'm not the most. It's my husband's um, uh, field. And I, um, if any questions that I cannot answer today, I'll pass it on to them and I'll you, um, you get my email and we can talk on that side, the technical side. So don't throw too many curly ones on me. <laughs> um, so then, okay, so we got we got the barley ready. Uh, the, the barley ready. We got the varieties. For example, is really important. You got feed varieties, and you have multi varieties, which is you know when you think about it, wow, what is this to do with me and my beer? Is the feed varieties are not very high vigour, it's not going to germinate it well because it's designed just for feed, it's not for enzyme um, um, activities, it's just to feed. So as well as how that farmer is going to uh, harvest that uh, feed barley is a lot faster and he's not really uh, taking a lot of care of it, so he's going to chip that grain. And if you chip the endosperm, it's not going to germinate, so it's not good for me in the mining process. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. I would like to, you know, can ask, no problem interrupting whatsoever. 
So then we go, after we have the good body, as I said, uh, the whole party, we've got everything going for us, we're going to put on the steps. The steps is a you know, giant silos where you're going to add water, uh, uh, the right temperature of water, of course, to that um, barley. So you want to bring that moisture up to about 45% to help you get uh, germination going. So the grain was, you know, as a seed, um, until we start to get the right moisture content, it's not going to do anything for you. So this is why the steeps come in. It's a really important part of the mining process to keep that grain healthy, um, you know, wanting to do its thing, and the temperature of that water is important. The quality of that water is important. Our water in Canterbury is really soft, uh, at the, you know, for uh, when you compare our malts to European malts. We do have that, I have to say, is a disadvantage on our side, because you guys are so used with, uh, with you know, uh, low, low pH malts and our malts come to the high end spec of pH, but I'll touch on that later on. And then after you get uh, the germination, you get uh, the, the steeps in you, they get to the germination boxes. Gladicube has five germination boxes and they are germination kiln vessels. So what that means is that we germinate and we kiln in the same vessel. So um, it's not very good economy wise because you're going to heat that, um, that vessel and then you're going to cool it again and then heat it again and cool it again. So, but it's good for hygiene, you know, every time we kiln it, all the, the bugs and, and no fungal growth on that germination box. Uh, it is just because at the time, um, as you imagine, no one ever done anything like this on this scale, the glad field, so it's not a lot of help for us on uh, equipment. So we need to source everything ourselves and luckily Doug bought a MIG welder <laughs> when we got married. It's probably a wedding present for someone. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that really helped us. We probably build everything that we got. And to be honest, that's, that's our secret. Uh, Doug's engineering skills, growing skills and modeling skills. <coughs> I shouldn't brag, I don't know, he's not here, so should we say something bad about him? Um, but you know, he's an awesome kind of bloke, I'm suspicious to say, he's really focused on what he wants, and you know, if Doug set a mind to it, he will get it done. And that really rubs off on Glad Fuel's philosophy. So he let, didn't take no for us, when people knocked at Mott Europe, for example, oh, can you uh, help me out? I said, no, uh, go away, uh, can you choose more? Well, when my competitor come along and say, uh, what, do you, what the hell are you doing? You know, I said, oh, we'll try and make my part of my body, so you won't last five minutes, I'll see you later. So all these uh, gave us some more um, incentive to, to survive. But it's a tough world out there, and you know, we have, uh, you have to be careful what you share information and everything. As, as I said, it's been 11 years, and probably in the last two years is when we started to see some um, you know, benefits of what we've been putting in. So after you got the germination, you were glad field uh, three years ago, invested in a, a, a multi roaster. And these modern roasters have been what make glad field um, shine and uh, ward, ward wide. It's a Czech Republic build, purpose built for glad field. It's the, the most modern malting roaster in the world to these dates. They actually rang me another day and said um, someone in Lithuania wants the same malt roaster that we had. And uh, so they, you know, I said, I thought we did very well for the last three years on the us having the technology, so I couldn't growl of them passing that on. Uh, Ray Voss, uh, they were wonderful guys, a bit like us, you know, Mavericks wants to do something out of the ordinary. Don't, uh, excuse me if any um, um, Germans in here, I don't have anything against you, but um, they, you guys are really stuck on your ways. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, went to, we went to Probat, for example, and said, can you do heat recirculation? No. Um, so can you guys uh, change the way the paddles inside that roaster are so we can have less malt sticking to the side of your drum, so less the stringency on the malt? No. So I went to Red Boss and they remember they say to me, I walk and probe at um, workshop and you have uh, you know uh, blue lines that you had to follow, um, you know, vest, hats, gloves, like um, sorry, glasses, uh, gloves, everything, and you just follow and 
you don't really see a lot of action, you're just, just really walking around to really tight health and safety. But then you go to Rambos, you see those marvellous sparking flying everywhere and everything's going and the guys say, do you want to have a crack cutting these with this grinder? Like, yeah, why not? So, <laughs> a bit like how we are, to be honest. Uh, yeah, we, we can have a go at anything and um, yeah, I must admit now that we're growing, we have to be a bit more careful. <laughs> and then after that, we, we get into our bags, uh, 25 kilo bags. Uh, of course, the malts get dressed. Um, I, I do want to talk more about you know what makes a good malt. I, I won't take too much detail on how we're making it, but I'm happy to share uh, that information with you and your questions later on. Uh, so you know, you know from from the from the germination, you get kill the kill malt, which is your base, like Pilsner. We have an ale. We've got American ale. We've got light lager, um, Munich, uh, Vienna. Aurora, all these guys here are kill malts, and then you have your colour and roast malts, which is uh, made in a uh, roaster. And like the crystals, they come from green malts, and uh, so does the, the, the red bats, the shepherd's delights, the toffee. And then you have the chocolate, the light chocolates, the roasted barley, the roasted wheat, they all made in biscuit. They come from, um, from a kiln malt, and then you put it into the roaster. But I can go deeper if you guys want me to. So, as I said, after, before it goes to the bag, we're going to dress that malt. And it's something very unique of Gladfield. And, and, and somewhat uh, never been done before. Um, we, we, we are really, really want the, the, the brewers to have the best out of that product. And as I say, like we grow a very good quality barley, why not make a good quality malt? And for that, you have to sacrifice something in your product. On, you, know, you don't want to compromise anything. And, and I'm not going to compromise on my cleanness. So all these guys on your left, you're never going to see it on your brewery. Is that correct? No. No. I thought so. Um, we'll come back. That's a real shame. But we'll, we'll, they'll come back and we'll explain it to you. But, Anyway, I was just saying that we screen our malt, so not many malting, malting companies do that. By screening our malt, we take all the half grains, we take all the dust away, and you end up with an even size malt. And it's really unique for us to have, um, you know, it's fat and even, and uh, it's clean and bright, so that's how you're going to recognise it, your know, good malts and glad fuel. It's free and it's chaff free. And I, I mean, you do know what chaff means. Um, so I need to say, chaff is just part of the straw, part of the barley. Uh, it smells uh, sweet when you smell or not. So I recommend you guys to do your senses when you're using, um, you know, when you're brewing for the first time with blend fuel or any malt. Use, use your, your, your senses to recognize that malt. Uh, make sure you are getting a good value for your money. It should be nice and crunchy, and what I mean by crunchy is that it's not going to break your feelings, you know, I mean the feelings in your mouth, not uh, your heart. Um, so, it's my accent for you. <laughs> and so, if it is going to crunch on your mouth, that means that it's going to, um, yeah, there you go, we are again. So, yeah, so the guys, yeah, very similar, aren't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the guys on your left, uh, you're never going to see in your, in your, on your brew house. The guys on your right, is your what you see. So, so there you go. Let's you got you know all the things I'll say. And it needs to taste good. You know, if it takes taste off, don't use it. If it if it is not crunching on your on your mouth, don't use it. It's an unmodified malt. You shouldn't be using it. Um, don't take any notice, you home brewers should get as good as the craft brewers or anyone else. And I don't see the gap in there and glad few that set up to, to break that barrier. You know, oh yeah, home brewers can just get the second best. Um, I, don't, I don't believe on that. Okay, so you got a good malt, okay? We've done all our, our work as we believe. And let's brew. That's me first through my first beer ever, by the way. <laughs> I've had a Gladfield Porter, I'm pretty proud of that. I love that mm -hmm. beer, it's my, my, um, my go-to. And that's on our first year pilot brewery that we have uh, in, our, in our business to help us develop new malts. So, 
You got the malts, and now let's see. You know, you you you, you had a look at it, and everything looks fine. Uh, tastes fine. Tastes fine. Let's see a bit of technical side of it. So technical side, of it, that's the classic COA of a craft malt or a malt that you guys should be using. It's a bit of a surprise for a lot of people, especially the DP, the diastic power. Um, and probability shouldn't be never below that. Right, so I'll, talk, I'll touch up on diastic power. It's my notes from a molster, he helped me out here. Uh, so the diastic power is back power is basically your how active your enzymes is. So how how well we done in the body process to help you, uh, you know, we convert the sugars into that malt. So if the, the DP is below 150, you know not not enough enzyme activities there, so you're not going to have a good fermentability, no conversion. If if the DP is higher than 250, I'll just be, be uh, that's the, um, I should know the name, Cobalt, William, forgot the name now, but um, that measurement there is two, is two, Leviton and that one, so just make sure you look, compare apples with apples when you're looking at DP. So if DP is higher than 250, which is very highly in Australia, likely, the malts in Australia, uh, you're going to have thin beers because it's these, these highest diastic powers mean that it's for the big boys, okay? So they're going to use that, especially all for export, let's say for, for the Japanese market. They want to add rice in there. It's rice is cheap as chips in Japan, but um, the malt's very expensive. So what they do, they get a malt that got very high diastic power. It's going to convert everything that touches it. But it's going to give you nothing at the end. So it's very thin body. There's not a lot of heat retention in there. And you know, and now if you want to throw any hops uh, in there, it's going to not it's going to be totally unbalanced. So look for this DP. It's really important. It's what makes the fuel really unique. And because of that, you know, be, be sure to treat that nicely. You get the fan and. Um, the fan is really for you know what what's um, what's your yeast going to feed off. If, if anything below 150, uh, it's not going to be enough feed for your yeast. So we're not uh, helping you out there, or you know not help, not making a good work for the yeast. As you say, you know you're not actually brewing and you're making a work. And if the fan is higher than 150, it's too much fermentability. Again, you know, high diastic power gives you high fan and gives you uh, too much fermentability, which is, sounds great, eh? You know, you want something that ferments well, but you want it within a reason. You want to, don't want to ferment that dry. You want to, you want to leave some residual sugars in there. You want to leave, leave something for your, for your hops to, to balance it out, and you know, for your mouthfeel. You know, uh, a beer, a craft beer shouldn't taste like water. It should taste something a bit like a wort, you know, a, a, a malt, a malt juice with um, with some hops in it. Lots, by the sounds of it. I should have grown hops, shouldn't I? Enough of thought. Um, cobalt, uh, cobalt index. Uh, again, okay, so cobalt these, these three top guys really go hand in hand. If you've got a high DP, you're going to have a high fan, and you're going to have a high cobalt. And a high cobalt means that I broke those proteins too much on my molding process, and it's too readily available, and it's going to buff like this when the yeast comes in. And it's going to, it's going to, far too much fermentability again. I can't stress highly enough. You want to have mouthfeel. And craft beer is important, and it's all you can only rely on that on your malt. And and again, if you have a cobalt that index below 37, you're going to have filtering issues. Okay, so you know it means that we haven't done our jobs right. Uh, we don't. None of our malts get out if it doesn't fit that that specs. We've got a full-time lab. Um, you know, we have a, a purpose-built lab. And we have uh, uh, you know two full-time lab guys doing lab tests for that, uh, which is probably something that you need for lab food when you think about it. You know we are medium uh, small uh, <coughs> craft moldings, but our lab costs the same as um, Joe White's because you still need to have 
the national leader, you still need to have the probability leader, you still have, you know, the Congress nation all that. So it's, it was about 250,000 to set up our lab and it still hurts when I write that cheap. <laughs> It's been off slowly but surely. Uh, the probability is, as I said, you know, you want something scrunchy. Um, if probability is before 90%, it means that's unmodified malt. I took shortcuts. I bought a line of barley that was in the, um, 98 to 100% germination. I paid cheap, cheap to my barley, and you are uh, paying for it on, when you're brewing. So, no shortcuts. Pardon? Fair. Fair is uh, free amino acids. Oh, okay. right. <laughs> um, I think it is. That's a good question. My boss didn't put that on us. Uh, I'll Google it. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I think it's, it, it is. It, yeah, it is. Oh, okay. uh, so I'm going to touch another thing too that's important in the malts that get overlooked is the moisture content. The moisture content of the malt shouldn't be higher than five percent. The reason being you want to crush that, and that needs to be, you know, uh, easy for you to brew with it. So high base uh, malts, high moisture base malts, will lower your gravity. Not many people knew that, neither do I, but you know, if you need more malts to have the same, um, you know, um, to hit the same gravity if you have a high moisture malt. So I can't stress high enough that malt and moisture don't go together. So when you open a bag of malt, you shouldn't leave that open. You should just really close that tight, airtight malts. If you see our sample bags and some of the one kilo and five kilos, it's thicker plastic, you see. There's no shortcuts again. Uh, it's, it doesn't come cheap, but you can't compromise the quality. So they they are designed for you to open up, use it, and done with it. It's not for you to use half of it. So when you go to your brew shop, buy what you need, crush what you need, and brew that. Anything left over, and you want to use it again, you just, it's a, it's a, it's a silly economy. Don't do that. Because the malt's not going to perform the same and you're not going to end up with a good beer. So you're not, you're not winning at all. So buy what you need and cannot stress high enough for the homebrew shops to be, make sure they, you know, don't leave them beans that open the lids up, you know, get the moisture in there. It's really, you know, it really sucks the moisture really quickly. Our bags are lined bags uh, designed for malt designed for not getting uh, absorbed, no moisture whatsoever. So, you know, don't don't settle for second beers. If it doesn't taste right, it's a bit slack. Sorry, on that, would you suggest if we've got bins at home with the malts to get like dehumidifier, <laughs> silicon gel, bags or something to put in there? That would be, that would be a great idea. I mean, of course, you no know, money talks a lot, but you know, just keep airtight as much as you can, okay? A vacuum seal is perfect. I mean, you know, it's, it is really affordable ways that you can look after that malt. And please do, you know, our malt's got, got best before dates on it. Counter on that on your, on your homebrew shops, you know. They, they, you know they, there needs to be a synergy here that we want to produce the best malts for you guys. And who is selling to you needs to do that as well. So, you know, we need to hold feet together and don't settle for second things. Can't stress that high enough. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna get my skates on. Right. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Um, cool. So, and then we got we got for colour molds quickly. Is that fresh, 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 fresh? I can't. Yeah. I mean, it's the only thing we can say. I was really lucky that they mentioned us there. Is the freshness that makes colour molds? Uh, is that punching the mouth when you're eating the, the crystals and, and that's what you want it. You want it to explode. It doesn't have to break your teeth. Okay? If it breaks something wrong, apart from the toffee I must say, toffee is very unique as high moisture malts, go back everything I've told again, but it's a unique malt. It's designed for um, you know for for add a lot of body and add a lot of uh, heat retention without altering your colour. So it's really roasted very uniquely. 
Don't crush the toffee malt by itself, please. That will make a horrible mess on your milk. Um, crush it together with your base and it should be good as gold. You can't really say crush it, because you won't crush it even if you want it to. It's just you're going to roll it. Even if a little crack, that's enough for the, for the you're going to get enough from a mash for that. <coughs> okay, so you understand the malts, you've got the specs, you've got best quality, you've got everything going for you. Now you're going to brew with it. How are you going to do? You got First thing you're going to do, you're going to crush it, don't you? Okay, that's the most important thing and it's the most crucial thing when you're using black fuel. You have to be gentle on that crush. It's a high fry ball malt and it's really even sized. So you don't need to tighten the milk to get that little grain that I showed you at the beginning. It's, that grain is not there for you. So it's all one size. So intact husk is really important. It's a very quick way to show you how well you're crushing. So if you look at your crush and I destroy that, that husk, I have to stop. I have to open up that milk. Okay? Because this is going to give you a lot of other issues uh, like you're going to have issues with watering because that husk is, is gone to help you out with that, you know, get that uh, wort separated from your, from your crush. Um, and you, you know, you're going to have the, 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 the tannin from, from, um, from the husk as well, so that off flavour, that harsh flavour. It's going to come through on your on your mesh like um, we had. Was that Ian that was saying about um, you know don't boil the don't mash too high temperatures and as well you get that from uh, crushing your malt too too much. So be careful, treat it gently. So it's a bit blurry. I let, I let the boys to take that uh, photo from me. I realised that my leg guys cannot take photos. They, <laughs> They can measure the act, though, which is good, which they pay for. Um, so, but, um, so mash is, is really is really important. Uh, mash the act is really important. And um, Stone would uh, forgot your name. I'm very sorry. Uh, he's going to touch up on pH, which is very important. I can't stress enough. pH makes your yeast happy. Okay. So if you have too low pH or too high pH. Your yeast will market and you all the lovely work you've done, getting the best malts available, crushing it nicely, developing your recipe, and you overlook your pH, you do. Okay, everything you've done is gone. So be, you know, look after it. And our malts, as I said, is in the high end of the spec of the pH, it's still within um, uh, spec. I don't want to use salts or my steep water because. It's going to compromise in other areas of my mold. So it's very easy for you to correct pH in your mesh. Uh, we do the Shigellata mold, which is our sour grapes. I love their name. It's a massive story behind it. I haven't got time to date, but um, it's... Uh, so and, and some of you may know, 1% of sour grapes lower your pH by 0.1. So you don't need much, like you know, like pH 5.9, you want to uh, alter the pH 5.4, so 3%, I suppose, gives you that 4% and helps you on your, uh, you can lower that from your um, base mold. Uh, okay, where to find us? Um, luckily, a lot of uh, home brewers are sharing the love for Blade Field and believing on our malts and understanding. If you go on our website, that's the page that I, um, I screenshot. We're pretty much across the border, apart from WA, which is understanding very expensive to get over there. Uh, so, you know, and, and Via Co does a great job distributing our mods. Dermot's a great guy, uh, we've got a good relationship. So hit up, ask your, um, you know, homebrew shop by the name, you know, Glade Field, have got Glade Field. No, I don't, why not? Get that from the pressure. <laughs> Easy. It's really available. We won't run you out. I promise. Um, you know, next time you're drinking a beer, you should really shout to the farmer. You know, he's a really important part of your of your process. Yeah. Don't take that for granted. You know, even even if you uh, you know thinking, oh well, but I'm supporting a, a kiwi farmer. Bugger that. <laughs> <laughs> because we come here for spending money in tourism here. So no. it's, it's all paid for. Don't worry. It's, uh, you guys gonna get back. I promise. You know, it's an 
you mark, you guys sell your macadamias to all, all over the world, don't you? I was at, uh, lucky enough to be at uh, Bundaberg another day, and I was blown away on of macadamia trees. And all these export, I think China got most of it, I don't know who has it, but you know, that guy they're eating their macadamia is supporting the Australian market, the, the, the Australian farmers. It's the same thing with our mops, okay? So think like this. It, it grown in a very unique uh, area and um, yeah, it's a niche market. Uh, that's me. I hope, I hope I share some lights on how to recognise good malts and, um, you know, don't settle for second best. That's what I'll say. And if you have any questions, please ask. Um, <laughs> we do have like mock catalogs to help you with raising your um, goodie bag and this is the mock alternative. Um, it was cheeky for a while but they let us do that now with the, um, the approval from especially Biomet, they let us put their name in there. Um, so it's just a conversion chart, you know, our names like sour grapes, for God's sake, what the hell, and um, uh, Gladiator, you know, sheep was their lunch. Probably, you know, but his names up there is for copyrights, of course, can't use, you know, carapils or, or things like that. So, this is all help you out with conversions and develop your recipes. He does, Dermot, or Gladfield for recipes ideas. His recipes are at the back if you want to build Gladfield for the first time. So, enjoy.